Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, today I am sharing a little personal project of mine, very much unaffiliated with the Washington Post, um, uh, where I learned how to make a map with electronics. And I'll explain all of that, um, but first for this project to make any kind of sense, um, I, have to first, uh, I have to first talk about clams. Um, so, so here's the backstory for this project. Um, I moved to Seattle in December, and Seattle's kind of like a sleepy city. There's like Microsoft, and like there's like the ocean, and then in the ocean there are clams. Um, so I, when I moved there, I got like really into clamming, um, and there are two very important things to know about clams, like take notes. Um, the first thing to know is that they're like occasionally toxic. Um, that's because they like eat by inhaling water through one hole and then like filtering out the nutrients out of that water and then like spitting out the water out of another hole. That's why they're also called bivalves because they do this out of two valves. Um, so, so there are very like certain times you can't go clamming. It's a very time dependent and location dependent activity. Um, the second thing to know about clams is that it's tide dependent. Um, so this is a little species specific. Most clams and other bivalves you can find at low tide around negative 0.5 feet and below. Um, but there's like this giant clam in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's called the gooey duck. Um, they look like this. Um, they look very alarming, but they're very kind creatures. They're very like soft-spoken. They don't like to say much. Um, but it's spelled geoduck, even though it's pronounced gooey duck, which is both appropriate for this conference. Um, and um, they can be only found at negative two feet and below. So again, very time specific, very location specific activity. Um, so I make a map. Um, the map looks like this. Um, there are LEDs corresponding to every single beach location. Um, and it pulls daily tide and toxicity data and it updates the map on a daily basis and tells me where I can go clamming because I need to know at all times. <laughs> um, so this is like the, the legend. So red is like you can't go clamming. Orange is like you can find most clams. And then green is when you can go find your gooey ducks. Um, this, this is how it works. Um, you have a map that I printed on cardstock. I punched some holes in it. Underneath is what's called a circuit board. That's like the thing that powers all your devices. Um, and then I've soldered LEDs onto that circuit board, which is powered by AA batteries. And then there's like this tiny computer called a Raspberry Pi, which does all like the data work and that like tells the, the lights to do what they need to do. Um, so I'm gonna first talk about um, the, the PCB, printed circuit board design process, and then I'll just like go quickly through like the data work. Um, so to design the PCB, I used this open source software called KiCad, and if you're like used to QGIS, which is like, you know, which is to say like vaguely janky open source software. Um, it's actually fairly intuitive. Um, so this is the view for when you're designing something called a PCB schematic. Um, here's a, a closer look. Like this is my first stab at my PCB schematic. A schematic is basically like how different electronic components relate to each other electronically. So like how your power source is connected to your lights and all that fun stuff. So I have like my, my LEDs, which are those square components, I have that weird like centipede thing, which is like the thing that like plugs into my Raspberry Pi. I have a level shifter, which is like a thing that lets you talk to the LEDs, and then I have a power source. Um, and I just need to say that my electronics experience like dates back to like September when I finally stopped procrastinating on this project. Um, so I had no idea what I was doing and I knew I had to add like capacitors and resistors to this project. Um, and people on the internet were saying things like current and like voltage. And I'm like, I'm not trying to know any of that. I'm just trying to clam and vibe. <laughs> Um, so I like phone a friend, I, I message my, um, my sister's partner, and I'm like, please don't let me blow up my apartment. Um, I also like reached out on Instagram, I was like, please does anybody out there know how to do this stuff? And I got in touch with like a distant acquaintance's father who like also helped with this project. Um, so like phone your local dad. Um, <laughs> So this is the final PCB schematic circuit. It looks complicated, but it's actually very simple, kind of. Um, there's this green line that runs through it, which is basically the data line. That's the Raspberry Pi is like sending out data signals, and it's going through each of these LEDs. Um, and then you ha also have a power line that's connecting to each of these LEDs. So like the red line comes from the battery through the LED through the back black line back to the battery source. Um, and then you have these like those like kind of parallel lines that like surround each. LEDs, those are called capacitors. They like help protect your circuit and like in case your like power source is like cantankerous and like mean, it like helps not have it blow up. Um, 
So that's that. After you kind of like have your schematic, you want to like design, you want to like geo-reference your LEDs and have these LEDs exist in real space. So the, the software kind of like spits out these things called component footprints, and basically that's like how they, that, how these components exist in real life. So that centipede thing becomes like that thing with the holes, and then like the LEDs are those little rectangles. Um, and it kind of spits this out into like this like gaggle, like this pile over here. Um, so you kind of have to position them in place. Um, this is what they look like when they're positioned. I've like geo-referenced these by, um, so what I've, what I've done is I export, hello? Um, okay, <laughs> I export a, an SVG out of QGIS into Illustrator. I make sure that my Illustrator map is the same size as my PCB. I need to stop standing on this line. Hello? Oh no. Do I get extra minutes? <laughs> Um, okay, great, fantastic. I'm gonna stand on this side of the line. Um, yeah, so I find like the relative position of each beach on my Illustrator file and I kind of just like position them on the thing. Um, and then you can kind of see these like little blue lines vaguely that connect each component. That's like called a net. Um, and it tells you how you're going to actually physically connect each of these components. So the next thing you do is, oh, that's like, you can kind of see the map underneath, yay. Um, the next thing you want to do is draw your traces, which are the copper lines that run and connect things. Um, the most challenging part of this is that you have to make sure your data line and your power line do not overlap, because that's it just doesn't let you do that. Um, and then the most exciting part is that um, the software lets you see what um, the um, PCB will look like. Um, <laughs> You can also write anything on them. It's very exciting. Um, I ordered my PCBs from this company out of China called jlcpcb.com. Um, and they came in the mail like a week later. Um, and I was like, great, I'm going to become an electronics engineer, like texted all my friends. Um, and then I realized I didn't know how to solder. Um, so and I've also like chosen like hard mode, like the tiniest component. So like that's the size of my resistor, which is like twice the size of my smallest component. Um, but it's fine. We, we can do hard things. Um, I go to my tool library, which has um, electronics uh, workbench and people there, um, and also uh, cat tacks. Um, my cat likes to like c cuddle things, so I was like, we can't do this at home. We need to inhale our lead fumes elsewhere. Um, so this is what the soldering process looks like. Um, when you order a PCB, it comes with this like metal stencil thing, and then you squeeze this like gross, goopy like metal paste. You kind of like squeegee it over the holes, and then you place your like different components on there, and then you stick it on this hot plate. Um, on the internet, you can they say you can do this at home, but it's like we care about lead poisoning, so we don't do that. Um, this is kind of a close up. Like that's those are like the tiny capacitors that I've put on there. Um, so this process works for like capacitors and resistors that are like slightly more heat resistant. Um, for the LEDs, I had to hand solder them because they're made of plastic and you can't really put them on hot plates and they're also like, they say there's like moisture in them from the manufacturing process, so they explode and all of this fun stuff that I read on the internet. Um, so I hand soldered them, not that bad, 18 of them. I got the hang of it by like LED number 17. Um, <laughs> this is what it looks like kind of all assembled. Um, at least like the, the PCB part. Um, and I turn it on, or like I try to turn it on, I plug it in, run the code, and like nothing happens. Um, in fact, it gets like really hot. Like the batteries, <laughs> the batteries start peeling, like and the batteries run out of juice really quickly. So I like go to Reddit, you know, and I'm like, please help. And they were like, you probably have a short somewhere. I'm like, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> and then I use this tool called a mult multimeter and I try to like find, find it. Um, but it's like not a not good enough tool to like, and it keeps like screaming at me. I'm like, please stop. Um, and so I decided to like go back to the drawing board and like test the circuit, which is like, all my smart friends are telling me to like test things before I order PCBs from the internet. Um, but I was like, I don't need to do that. Uh, so I, this, this white thing in the middle, it's called a breadboard and makes it really easy to just kind of like stick wires in and out. Um, and honestly, this didn't work either because I think I'm like really bad at soldering. Um, but in general, it's advised to test your circuit with a breadboard before ordering your PCBs. So at this point, I decided to just like, I had like an extra PCB lying around that I ordered, so I was like, I'm just gonna redo this, you know, and this is not systematic, whatever. And then I finally got three lights to light up with my cat being the, my supervisor. Um, and then 
you know, I was like, what's up with this fourth LED? Why won't it light up? And like, I tried doing some like systematic testing again. And I'm like, systematic testing never works. You just do trial by error. Um, so I just resoldered the fourth LED. Um, and then it worked, and it was like this amazing rainbow display of lights. Um, so that's like the hardware component of this project. Um, now for the code, um, I'm not going to actually run through line by line, but I'll, I'm linking my GitHub repo so you can go check it out. Um, basically, this project is powered by two scripts. Um, first, we have a R script that is automated by GitHub Actions, which is a service on GitHub um, where you can just like tell it to do things, and it will do things for you when you want. Um, so we have NOAA, the tide data that comes from NOAA. Um, I found basically uh, each the tide station that corresponds to each beach um, through like whatever spatial geometry. Um, and then I also have beach closure data, which is like all about toxicity. And then there's like some data wrangling process that I did. Um, and then it spits out this table that's like, is it toxic, true or false? Like, is there a clam tide, true or false? Is there a gooey duck tide, true or false? And then it gives me an LED status, status depending on like what permutation of tru trues or falses. Um, and then the second script is my Python script that runs on my Raspberry Pi. Um, and it basically takes all the zeros in my table and turns the lights red, uh, one's orange, and two's green. Um, so that's kind of like how, how the data process works. Pretty, pretty fun and straightforward. Um, link to the GitHub repo that I will send out uh, in my slides. Um, the final thing to do is assembly. So I made a map, you know, people know how to do that. Um, and <laughs> uh, there are like specific things that you can use to punch holes in paper, but I didn't have those things. So I used like a pen and like a 16th inch drill bit and it was really janky, um, but it's okay. Um, and then I put everything in a frame. Um, so you can kind of see um, the map taped to the mat matting of the frame. Um, my PCB kind of taped, it's all taped together. It's like, it's just really janky. Um, and then I have like this like power bank that actually powers the Raspberry Pi. So it's, it's powered by two separate power sources. I have the AA batteries that power the LEDs and the power bank that powers my Raspberry Pi. Um, and then I just hung it on my wall, which is really exciting. Um, also, you can't go climbing today anywhere in Seattle, just so you know, I'm so sorry. Um, but thank you so much for listening to my talk and happy climbing. Folks, we've got time for questions, um, if, you, if you want. <laughs> you said yes, yeah. get out of here. Um, yeah, any questions? Hello. Hi, how did you first get into clamming? Oh my goodness. Oh, can um, you repeat the question? Um, the question was, how did I first get into clamming? Um, I don't know, I was really bored. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, I, the first time I went clamming, we like were really intense about it and like got like 40 clams each and like we're just eating clams and it was really bad. Um, but yeah, that's, I was bored. Hi. Do you do stand up or improv? Um, I do not, thank you, that's really nice. <laughs> that's my next career after the electronics engineering. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, it's very small. It's just four by six. Um, I think if I did it again, I would maybe make it bigger, but also maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I chose the size based on like if I can find the right frame for it, because I didn't like, I would make a frame, but I didn't want to. How did you pick the locations? Yeah. Question was, how did I pick the locations? Um, yeah, uh, I picked them based on like the ones that I've already been to, and then like ones that are known for gooey ducks, because there you can't go clamming at every single, you can't go gooey ducking at every single beach. So yeah, um, I wanted to do 15 because that seemed manageable. Um, there was a lot of like research that went into it. Like I spent a lot of late hours like reading about like how many LEDs can like a Raspberry Pi power and all that stuff and. Um, I use like special smart LEDs that like are kind of new, like maybe even like five, six years ago, you can only like power maybe like eight LEDs um, off, a, off a Raspberry Pi or something like that. Um, so it's exciting. Yay, technology. Hello. You will go more now? Um, I literally finished this project like the, like three hours before I got on a plane to come here. Um, <laughs> So, um, TBD. We'll report back next year. We'll report back next year. Okay. Thank you. Thank Give it up you. for Janice, everybody.